Seasons, greetings, and Merry Chrysler, my fellow viewers. Welcome to the second episode of Siberia. Uh, today, I am going to find the key that the notary clearly told me was in his office and I neglected to look for. So I'm guessing it's behind this desk. Uh, this thing? Oh, he's got like a little stamp. <laughs> he has a stamp clockwork that just approves everything. That's neat. Uh, but it's not what I'm looking for. Anyhow, yes, I hope you all had a Merry Christmas. And I know I did. I got to see Julian for the holiday. He's quite the busy fellow nowadays. He's just about done with college, so... Rarer and rarer are the opportunities that I get to see him shoot the shit, play Nancy Drew games, and all those sorts of things like that. So, every chance I get to see Julian, the happier I am. I just realized... I just realized this is another one of those I need to give an item to the automaton, don't I? Do I have to give him the letter? I, I must give him something to stamp. What do I need that needs to be approved? Fax? Maybe a fax? No. Okay, he said the key was in the waiting room. I watched it, I heard him say it when I re-recorded the, or I, when I edited the video. People have told me that I may be a fool to apply the spoiler punishment to this playthrough because it is notoriously difficult. Hello, what are you? Not necessarily difficult, but uh, nonsensical in a lot of ways. Telescopic key. Okay, so it's going to be an unconventional key. Works for me. So we already have one spoiler punishment lined up after me learning the harsh realities of how this game works. And uh, who knows how many more we're going to get going. I think we'll do all the punishments at the end of the series, unless I accrue so many that it's only appropriate that I start to take my punishment in the middle of it. But I, I definitely want to give it my best, but I do not want to shirk off what's coming to me. Okay, so I'm going to give it to that fellow right here. Oh shit, he impaled him through the head. Someone commented, I think it was Palmport, that she studies art and um, automata. Or it's so weird for me to say. I've never said that word before, or heard it, or done anything with it. Automata is in like plural automatons. Is one of their personal studies of interest that they find very fascinating. And then she recommended me some books. And uh, as much as I'd love to read a book on automatons, I don't think I would ever have the time for it. I am getting the sense that I am out of the tutorial zone now. We're really into the meat of it. Okay, so we came... This, this is like a pentagon. We came from the bottom. I guess we'll do one at a time. I really gotta pay attention to every little bit of this game. It's so easy to miss things. But maybe the outdoors is just transitory screens. This is a factory. So, all right, let me, mission. No, I, I don't even have anyone to talk to. I'm trying to straighten out in my head what we were doing next. I, there's Hans, Hans is alive, and we need to find him somehow, and I'm assuming that there's like a clue to his location hidden in the factory. Is that what they said we're doing? Sorry, I went out of town for the holiday, and then I got, like, sick, and it was really annoying, but I'm... I mean, I was sick in the last episode. You guys could hear it in my voice. But I'm all better now, and I'm just trying to piece together what I'm supposed to do. There's a lot going on in here. Let's start Doesn't pulling like levers. Nope, let's try to pull levers and then decide not to. How about this one? What's that? It's like an automaton hamster, but it looks more like a dog with no arms or legs. No legs. Dogs don't have arms. Hmm. That's a water wheel, isn't it? So will this lever work now? That did something. Alright, I should... I should probably be gone back outside. I think I'm 
I might be solving puzzles that I haven't even been informed of. Ooh, the humming is louder out here. I'm starting to wonder how much of this game will take place in Valor de Lend, and then how much is gonna happen in actual Siberia with a Y. Yeah, okay, so I got that water wheel going. Alright, just just for the sake of thoroughness, I'm gonna check what's down the other four paths, or three paths, really quick. Just make sure there's nothing that's, like, obviously screaming. Come look at me first. Um, a pyre, maybe? Looks like some kind of fuel can. Okay, so there's just, like, a little... Oh, wait, I see a switch. You have to be really observant in this game to catch little stuff like this. Mm. This kind of reminds me of Mist. Okay, so that just transported what looked like a fuel tank, maybe, into the main factory. Um, we'll keep an eye out for that object somewhere inside. Maybe it'll turn up again. Uh, what is that? A train station? I think it might be. Train stations have such neat, distinct architecture. I wish there were more trains in America. Yeah, looks like it is. Huh. <laughs> I love how goofy her run is. <laughs> Okay, um, I do not have business at the train station yet. I think I can say that with sincerity. Uh, we, I think I can say that with confidence. So when, when I become totally and utterly stumped elsewhere, I will return to the train station and see if there's something I missed that was important. And then the last path is the one down here. Ooh. It's a nice looking estate, but will the door open? If this opens up, I think I'll check this place out good and thorough before I go back to the factory. Ah. The door's locked, but I've still got to get in there. All right, that, I don't even know what that place is supposed to be, but it looks very important. And she even said I've got to get in there. So, Oh, there's a path I can take around the back. Um, having played adventure games before, my hypothesis is that the key is hidden behind some elaborate series of puzzles in the factory, and that's where I will be going next. What the hell is that? Looks like a steampunk version of a scissor lift. <laughs> Man, this architecture is so cool. Also locked? The door's... Maybe I'll use that ladder eventually to pull vault in from the roof. I don't know. Oh, shit. Hedge maze. Massive hedge maze. Okay, forget about the factory. Love me a good hedge maze. The question is, will it be a real maze or is it going to be... Oh, a person. Let's speak to you. Good morning. You've got a magnificent garden here. Rise, peasant. Oh, please, don't talk about it. Since my gardener automaton broke down, there are weeds everywhere. You can't imagine how much work it takes me. I don't know whether I'm coming or going. We're not used to doing without our robot help here in Veladilan. But everybody says that we're going to have to get used to it. You're a foreigner. You must be a foreigner if you say Veladilan, or just an imposter in general. That's some shit that I would say. That must be a clue. She's not... She's not supposed to be here. Or maybe they just didn't brief the voice actress on how to say it. <laughs> That's a cool statue. I wonder if it was supposed to be half-finished like that. Probably not, because it's covered in moss. Yeah, nothing sneaks by me. Okay, this... 
this in hindsight is probably a, a very bad idea to go getting lost in a maze right at the beginning of an episode. Whoa, shit, a key. Vorlberg key. Um, that could open up the house for me. Or maybe it opens up this gate over here. That could also be it. I haven't tried this gate. Could be locked. Okay, this gate is locked. No point. Uh, will this key open it? No point. It's locked. Mm -mm. Maybe that goofy uh, key will open up the main mansion. Man, in my town, it was a very foggy, misty day today, and I loved it. Love every bit of that foggy weather, so long as I'm not driving on the highway. No. The door's locked. Okay, so we may have a key now to open an undisclosed means. No, okay. The door's locked. Well, I'm glad I found it, because that's probably going to be useful somewhere in the factory. Which is where I'm going back to now. Okay, now go up the stairs. Go up, go up the stairs. Go on, there you go. I heard that this game got released, re-released for the Switch, by the way. It's gotta be so cool. Hmm. Fancy little lounge in here. Oh no, this is probably Oral Break's office. There's a book up here that I can interact with. Now, why is that? Alright, we'll keep that in mind. One book does not fit in with the others. Uh, some letters here. Get ready for some more reading. Madame Vorlberg, Rue Grande, Valle de Laine. Some French words, recovery of outstanding payments. Madame, you will have received several warnings from my office concerning penalty charges incurred on unpaid invoices from the company La Colombe. The total debt for which you are responsible currently stands at 47,782 francs. I strongly advise you to acquit yourself of this debt by sending the necessary funds to our payment center. In the absence of such a response on your part, I will be obliged to undertake legal proceedings against you to uh, recover the outstanding funds. Yours faithfully... Blanchard, bailiff. Oh man, um, I don't think we can oh my gosh. read the one behind it. Invoices, invoices, more invoices. I never knew the factory was in such a bad way financially. These last two years must have been very hard for Anna Vorlberg. Yeah, that's bad. Were we about to like buy a company from these people and just take on a shit ton of debt? Yeah. Uh oh oh, look at this. A letter that she was writing to Hans. Valle de Lens, 6th of March, 2002. This game was made, and I think, I think released in 2002 or 3. Um, Dear Hans, I know how much you dislike the written word, but I do not have the time to forge you a voice cylinder. I am at Okay, hang on, wait. I wanted to mention that real quick. What the hell is this guy's Hans problem with words? I've never heard of a character in any story ever who developed to dislike words for some reason. Apparently he had an accident, and now he's, like, afraid of reading. I, I, mean, I get distracted. Um, I imagine that someone in your entourage will be kind enough to read these few lines to you. I received your latest set of plans. Your project is extraordinary. Your all-time masterpiece, perhaps. Time seems to have had no effect on your genius, quite the contrary. I'm proud of you, my dear little brother. Sometimes I find it hard to believe that a century has gone by since the last time I saw you. It only seems like yesterday that you rushed away from Valle de Laine. We undertook production immediately, following your instructions to the letter. The locomotive was ready within a week, if only you could see it. But you will see it, that much I have promised you. It is magnificent. It seems impatient to set out on its maiden voyage. There is only Oscar left to build. I hope I will finish him soon. But as soon as you can imagine, his mechanism is complex and takes a great deal of time and handiwork. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand you wish me to bring you that cursed prehistoric doll. The very thought of which I wonder if it is still in the cave, and if it is, what state it is in. But what does 60 years matter? After all, to an object already several thousand years old. I am going to find it, Hans, I promise you. I have a bit of a nasty flu at the moment, which is running me down a little. I should be... Oh, gosh, there's splashes on the page, sneezing on it. I should be better in a few days, though. The scale of the factory is taking shape. The lawyer from New York should be visiting, and we will be able to sign the contracts. Then I shall... Unfinished letter. Did she die while writing this letter? Oh, fuck. 
Yeah, the pen is on the page. I think she did. So Hans never got, gained that intel then. And wow, that is a steampunk locomotive. Yeah, so that is what was going on here. Now, this drawer is open, but I can't seem to look at any of the letters in it. Okay. So she was making a train. She talked about making someone named Oscar, too. I'm guessing Oscar is an automaton who was not yet completed. I think we'll have a look around the rest of this place, but I have not forgotten about that one book I could examine. Hmm. Oh, boy. This here is a puzzle. Okay, yeah, this is a this is a real proper puzzle. Doesn't look like that works. Okay. So I'm gonna need to do something here. Not sure what. Maybe it'll extend this ladder when I'm done. Uh that looks too complicated for me to figure it out without a reference of some kind. So we will keep our eyes peeled for such reference. never been here before. That was a tricky screen. I'm glad I found it just now. Yeah, that's really well hidden. Phone call. Yes, hello? Kate, what happened to you, my poor munchkin? I've been trying to contact you for hours. Mom. I'm in Europe, Ma. Job thing. Job thing. What? Europe? My God. Oh, I've got such happy memories. Why do we have Europe? a mom Some phone to contact in this game? Your father, but uh, that's enough of that. Tell me, where are you? Paris? London? Venice? Valle de Lene. Yeah, I know. It's a bit out in the boonies. What in the world are you doing out there? You know, business. I've got to see through the takeover of some old family business that's got a few debts. It's a really charming place, but there's one or two weird things going on here. I, I can't go into it now. Oh, well, that's right. Your old mother's too dumb to understand it. <laughs> you really do take after your father sometimes. <laughs> mother. Kate, you'll never guess who I saw yesterday. Ma, I haven't got a lot of time, you know. Frank! Frank? Ma, please, I've got to go. Frank! Frank Malkovich, the Russian opera singer. Well, maybe you don't remember him. He was quite a star in his day. Listen, Ma, I really don't have the time. I'll yeah, this seems back. alarmingly unimportant. He is as charming as he always was. We spent the... Mom, I really have to go. I'll call you back, I promise. Lots of love. Kate! Kate? That was a very specific non-sequitur. I wonder why that happened. Uh, anyways, this looks like the last boundary of the factory... Oh, there's that fuel tank thing. Okay, I see. That's really heavy. I've got to get some help. All right, automaton forklift. Let's go. How do I get this thing to work? Oh, you just you just crank him up and he does it himself. That's how. Where's he gonna take it though? Get back here, dude. Okay, we follow him at least. He's just gonna activate all the automatons in here. I like this guy. Hmm. Doesn't seem that I can actually interact with it. Alright, I'm gonna take one more look upstairs. And then maybe it's time to go check out that train station. Oh, now it does something. Maybe it's because I had the key my inventory before. Secret compartment with a music box in it? thing. What thing was that thing? 
music cylinder. If that's going to work, it looks like something's missing. It's a little gramophone. Why would that be hidden? Sounds like the Clockwork Orange music. Can I use the key on it? No. How about the cog wheel? No. Okay, well, I found a, a thing up here. I did a thing. Uh, but I'm not quite sure the, co the consequences of it. So, we have a control panel outside this office with very specific specifications on it. Not sure how to deal with that just yet. So I think we'll just go right to the train station before coming back to this. Can I board the train? I can. Oh, maybe I can actually have a look around inside. Ooh, someone's whistling. Wait, okay, so I can go in the train, but... Wow, this is a bougie train. Okay, I think there's someone over here. Yeah, a custodian. Some sort of street sweeper. I can hear him. Can I take these tools? No. Okay. Must be the other way. There he is. Get over here, lad. Nope, nope. Pay attention to me. Are you not important? Oh, that's so weird. I've never seen a game like this that renders in characters you don't actually speak to. What a nice detail. I appreciate that as a player. Just like real life, not everyone is important. I mean that in a not cynical way. This guy loves his little tune. Just me and little chipper. Okay, we'll check out the interior now. So... Now I'm feeling the Murdy on the Orient Express vibes. Fancy, fancy office chair. What's this thing? These shelves look as if they're made for valuable objects. Huh. These shelves... I could not imagine what you are referring to. There's gotta be something important in here. Here's some stuff. What happens when I pull you? Now can I twist the wheel? What the hell? What did that do? That's a very long telescopic key. Can I walk past this now? No, I have to I have to lock it up now. Alright, well we just did something to the engine. Something that encouraged the music to come back. Alright, so here at the train station I did something with a really long telescopic key. But I don't quite know what. You know what? I just had a thought. Maybe I'm supposed to give that world work key to the gardener. And it'll, like, fix her broken automaton or something. Can't think of why else it would be so close to her. Or maybe I use it on this thing. That's also possible. Oh, oh, totally. That's what I'm supposed to do. I just noticed the cross section there. Are we gonna break into this place through the through the window? No, oh, from the roof roof. I'm game. I'm always down for a good long ladder to climb. Looky here. This could be a. All right, new zone. Bad.
this is a spooky old attic. It's in the chest. Nope. Okay, these hitboxes are kind of weird. It's hard to tell when there's something to examine and when there's just a place to go to. Light bulb? There we go. Another classic Nancy Drew noise. Person! Get out! Ah! Run! <gasps> oh, is it Momo? How the fuck did you get up here? Mamas. You draw mammoths for Momo? No, I don't think <gasps> I will. Momo, it's you. You scared me. Yeah, he did actually scare me. I was I was like, oh shit, I broke into this person's house. What are they gonna do? Sorry. Let's uh, let's what talk. What are you doing Momo. in here? Momo want mammoth picture, like Hans picture. Sorry, I haven't got a picture of a mammoth <laughs> with me. I don't have a picture of Take a mammoth. Take paper and pencil and draw mammoth for Momo. <laughs> You don't give up easily, do you? All right, are we actually gonna draw the kid a mammoth. This game reminds me of Wizard 101 in so many fucking ways you wouldn't even believe. I can see that this the developers probably had a lot of inspiration from this. I guess we're gonna draw him a picture. Uh, let's ask him about Hans. Do you know if Anna came here often with Hans? Momo want mammoth picture, like Hans picture. Okay, he's not gonna cooperate. Momo, I've gotta go now. Until we give him the mammoth picture. That's a paper. How do I... How do I make a mammoth picture? Oh, you know what? We probably have to find a picture of a mammoth first. There must be one somewhere that's, like... Very distinct. Maybe in this desk. Anna! Looks like a diary. Okay, ready for some more reading. May 14th, 1930. Yesterday, something terrible happened. I do not know who to turn to, who to talk to, so I decided to write it down. You, dear diary, are now my confidant and sole guardian of my secret thoughts. We should not be reading this, but I suppose she's dead. Hans lies in the next room, teetering between life and death, and I am terrified. Oh, the injustice of life. First Mama, then Hans. Please, dear Lord, don't take my little brother away as well. May 15th, 1930. Hans made me promise to keep this a secret, but its burden is too heavy. I know I can tell you, though, dear diary. We discovered a cave in the mountains, a marvelous cave, with ancient paintings on the wall. Only a prehistoric man could have painted them, because there were depictions of mammoths, which are prehistoric creatures as well. That much I know. I hate mammoths now. It's all because of them and because of that stupid prehistoric children's toy. Wait, this was this was mentioned in the letter. Some 60-year-old doll that was actually thousands of years old? Why, Hans? Oh, why did you try and take it? And why did I let you climb up there? It's my fault you are in a coma now. Hans, if you die, I do not know how I could ever forgive myself. Is there a supernatural element to this game? May 16th, 1930. Hans still has not regained consciousness. Father cannot sleep, and Gertrude cries all day long. Outside, the heat is suffocating, but inside the house is icy cold and dismal. I still have hope, though. I know my brother. I know his strength. He will pull through. He never gives in. May 17th, 1930. I cannot think of anything else but Hans. In all my waking and sleeping dreams, I see his fall over and over. I see his fall over and over. I see him hitting his head on the rock and his oh-so-pale face softening. I have taken refuge in the attic. It is the only place where I can find any peace wrapped up in all my memories. The next day, five days have passed since the accident, and Hans has still not opened his eyes. To see him like this is unbearable. Please, God, protect him. Take my life, not his. Day after... I feel so desperate, so alone. I want to snuggle up in Father's arms, but I dare not. He is just so impassive. Oh, Hans, don't leave me here. Day after? It has happened. Hans came back to life. He opened his eyes and uttered my name. My name. Do you realize this is the happiest day of my life? I want to take to the streets and sing, to proclaim my joy to the world. Thank you, oh, thank you, God. May 22nd. TH 22th. Uh, I've noticed games do that a lot, where they just copy and paste... Uh, how wonderful, how beautiful it is. Gertrude and I cannot stop breaking into uncontrollable fits of giggles. Hans even wolfed down his meal today. I knew he was tough, my little brother. Even mother, even father smiled at me today when he said good morning. May 25th, 1930. I don't know whether I'm coming or going. I am totally absorbed in Hans' recovery. I have scarcely five minutes to myself to return to my refuge and scribble down these words. May 29th. It is very curious. Whether Hans is hungry, thirsty, or if he wants something, he cannot stop saying my name. He can't bear it when I leave him, even for an instant. Gertrude thinks that I should move my bed into his room to help him sleep better. I hope that Father will agree. June 2nd? Today was the first day that Hans has left the house. We went for a short walk in the garden, but Hans is still very weak. 
The doctor said we should be patient and shouldn't rush him. It is so hard, though. I hope so much that life can return to how it, what, to how it once was. Oh my god! There's like eight more pages! Okay, okay, um... Yeah, whatever, I already started reading it, so I'll just keep going. Uh, give me a second while I save the game. June 20th, 1930. Hans has been out of his coma for a month now. He still doesn't say much and has difficulty moving. He sits motionless for long periods of time, his eyes wide open, as though lost in thought. I have often had to call his name several times before he reacts. Then he will smile, and when he does, the moment is magic for me, and I couldn't possibly be happier. June 22nd, 1930. I had to talk to him. The burden was too great. I asked Hans about the accident in the cave to find out what he could remember. He could utter only one word, mammoth, and his eyes glowed so strangely when he said that when he said it that he frightened me. I realize now, is this the accident that made Hans afraid of writing for some reason? September 15th, 1930. I go back to school today, and for the first time in my life, I am dreading it. I am afraid of leaving Hans alone. Despite Gertrude's kindness and attention, I have the impression that Hans is much less nervous when I am there. October 20th, 1930. While I was doing my homework yesterday evening, Hans crept up on me so quietly that he made me jump. He took a pencil and a blank sheet of paper... And, curiously, he started drawing. It is the first time since his accident he has done anything but daydream. October 28th, 1930. Hans scribbles almost obsessively. It is all he will do, all day long. I feel it annoys father. Nobody else understands, but I can see that Hans is trying to draw mammoths. November 16th, 1930. Today is my birthday. Okay, that could be important if we need to know when her birthday is for, like, a combination later. Uh, take a mental screenshot of that. Today is my birthday, and Gertrude has made me an apple pie, my favorite. My father has not returned home for lunch, and Hans doesn't want to leave his room. The best present I could ever have is to see Hans back on the way to recovery. December 25th, 1930. Snow is falling. It's snow beautiful. Oh, man, a white Christmas. January 10th, 1931. The doctor visited to examine Hans. He seems happy that my little brother has fully recovered his faculties. It truly is a miracle. I don't understand why he doesn't talk more, though. Why isn't he livelier like he was before? Feb 9th, it is Hans' birthday. Today he is 11 years old. I have the strongest of impressions that actually he has lost five years rather than gained one more. Feb 24, 1931. The doctor has just left. I saw him whispering with father. Their serious expressions worried me awfully. What could they be hiding from me? I am grown up now at the age of 15. You can understand everything. I am too scared to ask father what is happening. March 15th, 1931. I have been thinking, and it seems to me that Hans's attitude isn't normal. The shock of the fall and his coma must have had much more serious effects than we first imagined. Hans, my dear brother, what is happening to you? April 4th, 1931. I have discovered the truth. Hans is stunted, physically and mentally. I eavesdropped a conversation between the doctor, father, and Gertrude. Gertrude buried her tear-filled eyes in her apron, and father muttered the word retard under his breath. How could he say such a thing? April 13th, 1931. I'm detecting a parallel here between Hans and Momo. It is Easter, and we're on school holidays. This means I can spend all day with Hans, protect him from father's permanent dark moods. He cannot accept the fact that Hans, his only son, will stay in this state forever. April 14th, 1931. It is truly difficult to accept, but it is not Hans's fault. Mine, maybe, but not Hans. I don't know how to make father understand. He seems full of hatred for him. It is dreadful. I feel so powerless. Oh, this is getting sad now. May 14th, 1931. One year. One year has gone by and it feels like an eternity. The situation shows no signs of improvement, neither in terms of Hans's mental health or father's attitude toward him. May 30th, 1931. Extraordinary. Father has decided to take Hans to Paris for new tests. He says that only in the French capital will he find truly competent doctors. We must make Hans ready for the great expedition. June 6th, 1931. No news from father and Hans, but I remain hopeful. I am sure they will take good care of my little brother. July 15th, 1931. They have returned. Hans rushed into my arms and started crying. It took me a long time to calm him down and get him to sleep. Father is still as taciturn as he was before he left. The French doctors have confirmed the diagnosis. Hans will remain physically and mentally impaired. I am stunned. 28th of August, 1931. The summer is coming to a close. It has been less stifling than the last. The sun has put color in Hans's cheeks. When I look at him, I have difficulty imagining that he will not change. November 16th, 1931. Father still says nothing and increasingly shuts himself away in his office at the factory. Christmas. She just wrote Christmas this time. 
Gertrude tells me that love and faith triumph over any science. I lack neither. God be praised. January 12th, 1932. Hans took... Father took Hans to the factory this morning. Hans was so afraid that I accompanied them. Fortunately, Father said nothing. I failed to understand why he insisted on bringing him there. January 13th, 1932. Father left for the factory with Hans once again this morning. I think he wants to persuade Hans that he could be useful for something. It is his way of resisting fate. Feb 17th, 32. For a month now, every morning, Hans has gone to work with Father at the factory. I'm not exactly sure what he does there, but he seems to enjoy it. I feel my brother's behavior has changed considerably. He is much less capricious. Fuck me, I cannot remember what capricious means. Shit, I, that, that's actually, like, important. I should, I should know what that word means. Given to sudden and unaccountable changes of mood or behavior. So he's mellowing out. Uh, April 14th, 1932. I could cry. Hans has made me a present. A small robot mammoth with a trunk that rises and falls. When father saw it, he nodded his head in satisfaction. May 20th, 1932. Both Gertrude and father now have their own robot mammoths. Theirs are even more intricate and finely tuned. Little brother is, quote, not such a retard after all. October 15th, 1932. Hans' mammoths now walk, raise their trunks, and wag their tails. It's incredible. December 27th, or 22nd, thuh, 1932. I'm at the head of the factory workshop, Mr. Grips, this morning. He says that for a young lad of 12, Hans is very gifted. It is a shame that he only makes elephants. There's a, a corsage tape in here. Interesting. February 11th, 1933. Father and Hans were locked in a long discussion yesterday, or should I say Hans was locked in one of Father's long monologues. As it is inconceivable that Hans should go to the school like other children, Father wants to take him on as a worker at the factory. However, Hans will have stopped making his own little devices. Hans' silence, his half-gaping mouth, and staring eyes finally sent Father off in a rage. So he's turned into some kind of clockwork savant is what it sounds like. February 12th, 1933. I tried to broach the subject with Hans. I suggested he should obey Father. Learning a craft at the factory is his one chance to do something constructive with his life. He is so gifted and takes so much pleasure in making automatons. He did look like he wasn't listening to me, but I know he'll think about it, what I said. February 20th, 1933. It's not that Hans cannot speak. It's rather that he doesn't want to speak. He uses the least possible words for communication. Except with me, but he is still very economical with words. Whoa, really? He doesn't like speaking, but he still can. That is interesting. May 15th, 1933. Incredible. Hans was not just satisfied with learning how the assembly line works. Instead, he has completely redesigned it. Father and Monsieur Grips, I think that's Grips, I don't know what other letter that is, are taking a serious look at his plans. July 10th, 1933. Father has wanted to talk to me about my future. Since I passed my exams, he wants to send me to university because he says my intelligence is astounding. My heart was beating so loud. It is true, I do love studying, but I couldn't bear to be away from Hans. September 2nd, 1933. What a ghastly summer. I have been permanently torn between my desire to go to university and my refusal to leave my brother. I talked about it with Hans, but he said nothing. That same evening, I found my own little mammoth broken. Oh, he doesn't want her to go. October 9th, 1933. Hans had another fit of hysterics at dinner again. Father announced that Hans' new assembly line would soon be finished. However, they have removed the automaton parents that shout orders as they were deemed superfluous. Hans was livid. He hurled his soup dish to the ground and stormed off to his bedroom. Well... <laughs> I'm sorry, automaton parrots that shout orders at people, that's too funny. What will happen between the both of them when I'm not here? October 17th, 1933. Despite my scruples, I am finally leaving. Hans has not talked to me for a week. Father would not understand if I told him why I wanted to stay. My head is so heavy. Christmas. It is so strange to be home. I had never left home for, so long, for such a long time before. Once we were alone, Hans did not stop talking. Words just leapt from his mouth. How he laughed at his excitement. He presented me with a delightful little ballerina to replace the mammoth, he told me. I was so touched that I started crying. Distance has done nothing to harm the strong bond between us. September 10th, 1937. Oh, yikes. That's, that's a time skip. That's about four years later. It is strange to pick up this diary once more. At first, my impulse was to tear it up, but I resisted and instead succumbed to my second desire, which was to write for a while. I am alone in my attic once more. I have been home for two months now, 
and after a summer spent living with the intense joy of being reunited with my brother, Hans has returned to the factory, father is aged so, and Gertrude's arthritis causes her terrible pain. So four years she's back from college now, and the family's still together. September 13th, 1937. All in all, these last four years have been kind to father and Hans. Their relationship is less tense. They still do not exchange much conversation, but they now have a thing in common. The factory. I'm even beginning to feel a bit jealous. Silly, really. September 17th, 1937. Hans hasn't changed. To help Gertrude, he has designed a totally automated kitchen, and Gertrude can't stop moaning at the wooden puppets. Oh, how I adore them. October 9th, 1937. I went to go and see father and Hans at work. I hadn't been to the factory for ages. It is strange how much it has changed. I was very curious to see them and set about their tasks. I like father's new office very much. Hans has a small workshop on the first floor, crammed with odds and ends, unfinished robots and designs, exactly as I imagined it, in fact. October 15th, 37. The factory is working very well. Orders for new toys keep coming in, spurred on, spurred on by the run-up to Christmas. When I was at university and I said my name was Vorlberg, people would ask me if I had any relation to the Valle de Lenn factory. Now I know the effect that Hans' genius has had on the factory's renown. So really, Hans is the progenitor of this massive fame that the, the Vorlbergs got. I thought it was generational that it start with him. And his story begins with some weird cave paintings and mammoths and shit. November 2nd, 1937. To make myself useful, I started helping father set his papers in order. The most extraordinary thing of all is that for the first time ever, I have the opportunity, I have the impression that the three of us form a real family. Aw. I guess Gertrude is a maid. Or a cook. December 8th, 1937. Hans never ceases to surprise me. Between home and the factory, his behavior is still very different. In his workshop, he is serious and concentrated. A proper young man who keeps his eye on everything going on, constantly on the move and in control. Once ha one has the impression that each single toy is his very own infant. At home, he turns back into a child once more and is either moody or a happy-go-lucky buffoon. Christmas, the most wonderful Christmas of my whole life. Hans and I could not stop giggling like children beneath father's disapproving glare. I know that he was only pretending, really. Our hearts are so full of hope. January 5th, 1938. Hans came to see me in my bedroom yesterday evening. I felt terribly awkward, terribly ill at ease. I might have guessed... Hans wants to leave. Leave Valle de Len. The house and the factory. He wants to go traveling. He doesn't know where to or for how long. That's just like him. I was so shocked that I told him his plans were foolish. He left my room without a word, his head bowed. January 7th, 1938. I thought that he wanted to leave because of father. Not at all. It's because of the mammoths. He wants to go tracking mammoths. That's why he's in Siberia, damn it. I thought he had gotten over his obsession. I know why my brother only too well. I wouldn't dream of telling him his quest is useless. It isn't worth it. He will not listen to reason. January 10th, three days later, I was so selfish the other evening. I returned to talk to Hans and ask him gently if he was sure of his decision. I already know what the reply is going to be. Nothing will make him change his mind. January 19th, 38th. Despite my profound sadness and despair, I must help Hans fulfill the destiny he has chosen and announce the news to father. I fear the worst. So, so you have to break the news that your your autistic little brother is going to go on a mammoth hunting journey to Siberia. This is great. Jan 24th, 1938. The worst was worse. Well, actually, never mind. The worst was worse than my fears. The worst? What? What kind of a sentence is that? The worst was worse than my fears. Father's anger was terrifying. He shut Hans away in his workshop at the factory and has forbidden all visits except from Gertrude, who feeds him. Feb 1st, 1938. Father has decided that Hans should remain locked up for as long as it takes him to abandon his infantile decision. Gertrude tells me that Hans is very despondent, yet highly resolute. The worry is driving me mad. Feb 6th, 1938. As soon as Gertrude returns from the factory, I hasten to get news of my little brother. He doesn't say anything. He just fiddles with bits and pieces, she replies every day with a sigh. I have tried desperately to reason with Father, but I know I am just wasting my breath. Feb 9th, 1938. Hans is 18 years old today, and he is all on his own for his birthday. Feb 20th, 1938. Okay, so we've learned both of their birthdays from this entry. In secret, Gertrude delivered to me a small robot from Hans. It's a robot of us as children. It works with a small cylinder punched with tiny holes. I quivered with emotion as I turned the key. The message it gave me was simple. He was telling me he loved me very, very much. That sounds like the music box we found in the office. February 20, 21th, 1938. 
Gertrude gave me a different tiny cylinder for today's toy. Hans is truly incredible. He has found a means of communicating between us and us alone in total secret. So they communicated with little speaker tubes. February 27th, 1938. My days are spent eagerly awaiting for Hans's messages. He has now resolved to run away. He is preparing his escape, like if it was a game. Why is it, I wonder, that there was, like, leaves and twigs taped to the journal? March 6th, 1938. Gertrude has returned, and she is beside herself. Hans has disappeared. Yes! Free my man! Father has not even deigned to return to the workshop where he locked up his son, nor find out how he managed to escape. He just gave me a black look, as if he knew we were up to something behind his back. March 7th, 1938. It is beginning to dawn on me that Hans has gone. I miss him so much. Lord, please protect my little brother and watch over him for me. March 11th, 1938. With Hans gone, father now locks himself away, night and day, at the factory. The house is so gloomy now. March 12th, 1938. This morning I caught father in the drawing room installing a coffin on a trestle. The sight of it made my blood freeze. What on earth is he up to? My questions meet only with the stony silence and a permanent black countenance. March 13th, 1938. Behind closed curtains, the drawing room with the coffin, surrounded by huge candles, has become a veritable funeral chamber. March 14th, 1938. This is ghastly. I have just understood what father is up to. This morning the priest came to pray before the coffin and I finally caught on. Father is in mourning for the death of Hans. Father made the priest believe that his son was dead. How could he do such a thing? This is the last page. March 16th, 1938. In the madness occasioned by his grief, my father grows ever more cold and calculating. He contacted his old friend, Dr. Schmoll, who duly drew up a bona fide death certificate without ever seeing the body. I dare not imagine what yarn he spun. March 17th, 1938. Hans' funeral will be officially held next Sunday. Father strictly forbade me to attend. The sordid masquerade makes me feel ill, but I cannot denounce the subterfuge, or else I will display my father's mental instability to the world. The shame would kill him, that much is certain. March 23rd, 1938. I have to get away. Far, far away. And the final entry, April 23rd, 1938. No, I will not leave. I have thought long and hard. My life is here next to my father. He needs me too much now. The factory needs me because father is incapable of running it now. Besides, I can only find peace of mind among Hans's robots. And how shall I know when he... You're not supposed to say robots. Those are automatons. And how shall I know when he has sent me new ones if I am not at home to receive them? No, I shall not leave. My destiny is to remain here and keep watch. This has given me a thought. Are all of these designs, all these robots, the designs of Hans? And they're just being sent. Oh, no, return to game. They're just being sent all the way from Siberia where he pursues his true passion of tracking woolly mammoths. Well, respect to my King Hans. I hope that he finds his woolly mammoths. Um, I don't know how to draw a mammoth, though, for Momo. So, I'm trying to gauge what happened to him. It sounded like... I've, I've heard of uh, very rare instances where, like, uh an individual hits their head and when they wake up from their coma they have like an incredible proficiency at mathematics and they're just like suddenly math savants and they can do all sorts of crazy shit that they were never able to manage in their original state oh, i just turned off the lamp i didn't mean to do that uh so yes i've heard of people with situations like that this sounds similar but i don't quite know it's interesting but there does sound like there could be some kind of supernatural twist on it. Momo, can we chat? Momo, I've got something else I want to ask you. And it makes me Momo wonder, too. Listening. This this makes me wonder if Momo has, too, found the Mammoth Cave. You remember me, don't you? I'm Kate. Draw a mammoth for Momo, please. All right, well, this is... You must find me a bit rude, turning up places uninvited where nobody knows who I am. <laughs> See, it's kind of my job, you know, to get involved. But don't mind me. Just carry on with what you're doing. Momo, not mind. Anna, kind. Never angry. That's right. She won't be angry. Not now. Can I ask him about anything? You're a sweet kid, Momo. But I can't draw. Least of all, mammoths. Draw a mammoth easy. 
Hans draw mammoth. Anna draw mammoth. Kate, too. I mean, maybe I could do a quick squiggle of a box, say, that. <laughs> We're really has arguing with him on this inside. point. No. Momo want a real mammoth. <sighs> My goodness, you are one stubborn boy. There's something I'm looking for, but I don't quite know what. I need a clue, anything that might tell me where Hans is. You want to help me, don't you? First, you draw mammoths for Momo. And if I help you, you help me, right? Mm, Momo no. Kate is kind. Kate draw mammoths for Momo. Then Momo tell Kate secret. You've got a secret? First, draw mammoths for Momo. All right. We'll get him... His damn mammoth. Let me just try the rest of these real quick. What's going to happen to you now that Anna is gone? Momo big now. They want Momo live at inn. Momo don't want. Momo take care of Momo. From what I've seen, you look pretty resourceful. It must be fascinating to live in a village full of automatons. Automatons made by hands. Difficult work. Mm. When Momo big, he do like Hans. Momo friend of automatons. So I get the feeling that Hans really did design all these automatons himself, and Anna was just the face of the operation. Tell me, Momo, did you come here a lot with Anna? Mm-hmm. Anna like Momo. Anna like Hans. Anna on journey. Anna on journey. Do you know if Anna came here often with Hans? Momo want Mama's picture. Like Hans' picture. Momo, I've got to go now. But see you later, maybe. Okay, so my objective is now to draw a picture of a mammoth. Uh, I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> maybe I can sit down at this desk and do it? Oh, ink. Wait, is that ink? What is that? Ink bottle, yeah. Can I take this and plop it down right here? No. Can't believe I didn't take that ink before. Well, shucks, Momo. I don't know how to draw you a mammoth. I might call it an episode there, but we have our objective. It seems like Momo is going to break it down for us. This is a very interesting story now that they've actually put it all into perspective. I am uh, curious to see where it's going. It's very whimsical and silly in places, but now it's really starting to feel real. I am enjoying.